Thank you, Kim, for that kind introduction. Um, I, I'm amazed at how astounded people in the UK are about the North Wales thing. Um, it's actually quite a marvelous university. Anyway, just a tiny bit of uh, sort of reminiscence about um, my life in science, because I didn't start out as a scientist. Um, I, was, um, I was sent to a Waldorf school in New York City where my parents lived. And uh, for those of you who know about Waldorf, it doesn't have an astounding reputation for turning out endless uh, science engineers and math uh, people. It's much more oriented towards the arts. Uh, but um, I had a fantastic teacher whose name was Mrs. Grimm. She was not grim at all. She was amazing. She was a failed chemist. And you know, back in the 50s and 60s, it was very hard for women who were at, you know, in hard sciences like chemistry to uh, hold an academic position. And so she decided to teach instead. She was a marvelous teacher. And she taught us in the highest heels I've ever seen. Um, that's the thing I remember about Mrs. Grimm. The other thing I remember about Mrs. Grimm is that when we were 15, a group of us said, we want an advanced biology course. And to her, that meant a complete survey of all the phylogenetic tree in nature. So we learned about everything from liverworts to silentiorata. And then she said, and this is how it all works. And she taught us this. I don't know if any of you know this. This is the famous Merck Intermediary Metabolism Table, which some of us have had to slog through. And um, when I finally uh, got through the whole thing, I had more or less memorized most of the middle bit because um, I thought it was so beautiful. It was so crystalline. It was the essence of scientific deductive reasoning, how these wonderful biochemists worked out how the cell actually delivers energy to itself. And I thought, well, that's good. It must be the same for how you develop an organism, which was my true love, pattern formation. So I was looking for these development charts. And it's at that moment that I decided I really wanted to do all science, and that's why I went to the UK. And why I went to Bangor is another point. But uh, soon after I got there, I realized that my real love was morphogenesis. And I was specifically amazed about limb morphogenesis and the emerging ideas of gradients and morphological information, positional information. And I went to my um, zoology teacher, Mr. Jackson, and I said, do you do any of this? And he says, no, no, dear, you must go back to the US. So that's how I ended up back at the US. And <clears throat> over the last 25 or 30 years, I've become more and more obsessed with regeneration as a sort of recapitulation of developmental mechanism. And so what I'm going to tell you about today is the last 10 years or so of the forays of, of my labs, as it is, um, into various aspects of regeneration, the most um, stunning one of which, now I don't know about a pointer. That's the only thing I'm missing here. The most stunning thing about the, the regenerative process can be easily <clears throat> shown here um, in a newt, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> which is whose leg has been cut off on the left. Now, before you get all worried about the newt getting its leg cut off, they lose their legs rather regularly. It depends on who's after them. Um, they lose legs, they lose tails, etc. I'm sorry, I didn't bring a pointer. Peter, thank you. The red button in the middle. The button in the middle. Thank you. That's what friends are for. So after, a, uh, after a, um, a, a, an accident, let's say, where the, the limb is removed, it grows back, and it grows back exactly the same. Here, you see it growing back. It hasn't finished growing, but it's growing nonetheless. And ultimately, it will become a perfect match. And if you do it again on the same animal, and again, and again, and again, it grows back every time. I thought that was magnificent. And I wondered why it is that we haven't been able to maintain this kind of profound regenerative capacity. We all know that starfish can regenerate limbs and large body parts. The fish are also very good regenerators. They can regenerate tail, jaw, even parts of their heart, fin. And the champion regenerators are the salamanders. Um, you saw one kind of salamander, the newt, but this is another kind, the axolotl. It's an aquatic one, and I'll tell you a bit more about our work on that. And the questions we try to address in the lab are, why did we lose this capacity? Is there some obvious reason why we can't regenerate like these animals can? And one possibility is that they are um, perhaps more prone to cancer because regeneration requires a lot of proliferative activity and perhaps that makes an animal prone to cancer. Well, that doesn't really fit because none of these animals get cancer any more than we do. Perhaps there's an immune problem. Maybe we are too good at, our immune system is too good and theirs is not set up for uh, really uh, well-tuned well uh, immune responses to a host of pathogens. And 
that might ha there might be some truth in that, and I hope to show you what we think is going on there, because I think there is a, a profound connection between the immune system and regeneration. But a simple explanation like this doesn't really work. I think this is the answer. We're losers. And the reason that we've lost it is not clear, and it may be stochastic. It may not have been for any good reason. And if that's the case, we're actually in good shape, because it means we could regain it again. So let's look at how regeneration actually proceeds. If you are hurt or damaged, your tissue turns into an inflammatory storm um, and a number of cells come in from the immune system to clean up the mess to produce an inflammatory response, which is actually a healthy response. And if left to its own device, will produce scarring rather than replacement of tissue. So the question is, how do you get this balance right between inflammation and cell replacement so that you can actually effect repair from what otherwise would be um, a, a rather adverse outcome of the initial damage. And that's what we work on. One of the things that we noticed very early on was that a factor that I'd become interested in, insulin-like growth factor one, had a couple of different lives, and one of those lives appeared to be as a regenerating promo regeneration promoting factor. So it's a factor that um, is very important in uh, prenatal life. If you uh, knock out this gene in a mouse, the mouse does not do very well. Um, it's also very important for proliferation, but also differentiation of tissues after birth. And it appears to be induced in response to injury. And as I'll show you, it's very good at helping regeneration along in mammals. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the molecular biology of this, uh, of this factor, because you'll have to understand it for the rest of the talk. And what I'll say about it is that simply there's a local form, or several local forms, that are produced in response to a number of stimuli, but do not leave the tissue of origin. And contrasting to that, there's a circulating form that is expressed out of the liver in response to growth hormone and circulates. And why is that? How does that work? Well, here's just a small amount of molecular biology to explain that. The gene is rather complicated. The insulin-like part is the red stuff in the middle. And everything else on either end is alternatively spliced. I'll leave out any discussion of the signal peptide. It's obviously got a signal peptide. It's a secreted factor. But I'll just focus for a minute on these interesting E exons, which are otherwise known as extension peptides, and differ from insulin. Now, what happens when this gene gets made into protein is that the extension peptides are still stuck to the original uh, insulin-like part and are cleaved off in the liver um, very effectively to produce a, a, a 70 amino acid uh, factor, which works um, in a sort of um, more of an endocrine fashion and is on the market, actually FDA approved, for treating growth hormone resistant short stature children called Incrolex. However, that's not what normally happens in response to injury. What normally happens in response to injury is there's a burst of local form of local forms, and these forms are these propeptides. And as I'll show you in, in due course, they're very important for the biology. So this is the form that circulates. These are the forms that stay put. When you overexpress one of the forms that stay put, namely the EA propeptide, um, we did this very early on in the piece. We found that the mice were immense. They were muscular. They looked like Schwarzenegger. And that's what they were called in the press. They got a lot of press, and they're big, and they're strong, and they're disease resistant, actually quite aggressive. And over the next 10 or so years, or actually 14 years, various members of my laboratory tested these mice in various ways. And we couldn't find anything wrong with overexpressing this particular factor in skeletal muscle, which is where we had initially started the, the uh, investigation. And in fact, it was possible to downregulate all sorts of um, adverse outcomes in ALS, in muscular dystrophy. But most important for this talk is down here. We found advanced healing. We found um, an increase in um, a number of uh, sort of um, uh, uh, pro-regenerative uh, pathways, anti-inflammatory pathways. Uh, bone marrow was, was brought into play. Um, it looked for all the world like a very uh, salutary factor. And in fact, we were able to publish a number of good papers, making the postdocs happy. And the good news was the mice were happy too because they never got cancer, which would be one of the fears you might have about this particular um, factor. So I'm going to fast forward to the work on the heart because this is really where we focus the lab now and tell you a little bit about the work we've done using IGF-1 as a factor to promote cardiac regeneration. So the heart is one of our least regenerative organs. It's even worse than the brain. As we know, an, a myocardial infarction produces a uh, response which is usually ends up in a scar, which compromises the function of the heart and ends up with heart failure most of the time, if it doesn't kill you in the, in the first few days. 
Um, what's interesting about mammalian heart biology is that as neonates, we can regenerate just as well as any of those animals I showed you in the, fr in the front of the talk. And this is a beautiful piece of work by Enzo Perello and Eric Olson's lab showing that resection of the bottom part of a neonatal mouse heart, don't ask how he did this, it's a microsurgical miracle, produces um, a very significant scar, a clot, that then resolves very, very rapidly, just the way a, a zebrafish heart would regenerate or a new heart would regenerate. However, seven days later, if you do the same procedure, on a seven-day-old mouse pup, it doesn't uh, heal. It's exactly the same as an adult. So something's happened in that first seven days. But the most important thing about this experiment is it proves that we haven't lost anything genetically. We've lost some sort of mechanistic approach to our genome, which then is somehow compromised in those first seven days. Among other things, one of the things that happens during the first seven days of life is that your tissue in uh, IGF-1 goes through the toilet. It just disappears. It's very, very rapidly turned off. Well, if that's the case, is there any connection between IGF-1 and better regeneration? So Maria Paola Santini, who's uh, here in the, in the audience, um, who was uh, one of my star uh, students at EMBL and now is still working with me at Imperial, did an experiment in which she overexpressed the same form of IGF-1, this propeptide, with a cardiac-specific promoter, made a transgenic mouse, and looked to see what happened after coronary artery ligation, which is a way of in, um, mimicking a heart attack. And what the mouse uh, shows is an increased um, amount of scarring after uh, one week, which is absolutely typical of the way heart attacks happen in humans. And the animals with the IGF-1 transgene didn't look any different. So there wasn't really anything about those first uh, seven days that changed much. It wasn't until Maria Paola looked later that she found that, in fact, the animals who had the transgene were effectively healing their heart, whereas the animals that did not have the transgene had the canonical thinning left ventricle and were uh, destined to heart failure. So uh, we then uh, continued the experiments. Those were done uh, actually at, at uh, EMBL, but these were now done at, um, here in, in Imperial, where Maria Paola and her team, Bawana Pudel and Tommaso Poggioli, uh, looked at the uh, possibility of delivering IGF-1 as a factor that would be sort of a therapeutic approach rather than just this um, fairly unclinical and, uh, and irrelevant model of transgenesis. And what they found using a stem cell mediated delivery system, in this case P19 cells that are readily uh, converted into cardiomyocytes, um, infected with the same vector so that they expressed the same gene, then delivered the cells to the heart found that the cells persisted for quite a while and, among other things, produced a, a diminution of the usual pathological hypertrophic response. There were other uh, functional improvements as well, but this one was very dramatic. So that is to say that IGF-1 didn't have to be around for the whole animal's life. It could be delivered at the end of a, uh, or uh, during um, a particular um, uh, inf injury protocol and still have an effect. So what does IGF-1 do? Well, among other things, we were interested in the possibility that it improves the revascularization of the area that is affected by the infarct. And the heart is one of the most highly vascularized tissue outside of the brain. Um, and in fact, we were interested in the possibility that a particular subset of cells emanating from the surface of the heart, named, called the epicardium, could perhaps be coerced into helping with revascularization. Now, why did we think that was a good idea? Well, the um, fact is that the surface of the embryonic heart is covered gradually by this epicardial th single cell layer, which then transforms itself and uh, goes und undergoes um, epithelial mesenchymal transition, enters into the heart, and magically forms the entire coronary vasculature. Now, if you have an injury, it's thought that that uh, epicardial layer has to get reactivated to do it again. And the question was, did that have any re relevance for the effects we were seeing with this transgene? or with the uh, delivered gene. So uh, Lars Bachmann, uh, who split his time between Embel and Imperial, uh, did an experiment looking at the transcriptomics of the uh, epicardium during uh, the injury, but also in, with, uh, in animals with and without IGF-1. And to make a long story short, he found a number of very interesting patterns, including a whole slew of new genes. But what he was interested in specifically was the fact that this one enzyme, RALDH2, went up by 40%. Now, why is that interesting? RALDH2 produces retinoic acid, and retinoic acid is known to be a powerful morphogen. 
and has um, a number of roles in the embryo, but had been identified in the recovering zebrafish heart as a powerful component of the response to injury. Now, what happens in a zebrafish heart is there's a rapid deployment of RALDH2 as the entire epicardium becomes activated after you cut off the bottom of a zebrafish heart, just like uh, in that story I told you about the neonatal mouse heart. And the, um, the entire um, um, procedure by which this uh, heart then delivers the right signals to regrow that tissue appears to be at least partially due to an increase in the retinoic acid production by the epicardium. So here's just a picture of how it actually looks. Here's the epicardium during embryogenesis producing this RALDH2 enzyme, and here you see it in regeneration. So it's a very, very robust response, and we were interested that IGF-1 appears to increase that. So just very briefly, um, what I've told you about these experiments suggests that this is a, a very promising factor for helping with heart disease. Now, I'd like to just tell, take a few minutes to talk about these propeptides. One thing that we noticed early on in the literature was that one of them, the green one, EB, comes on very uh, rapidly after injury of any tissue and then disappears as the alternative splice shifts. Now you have this other form, which is the persistent form and the majority of the IGF-1 propeptide that you see. Transgenic analysis of mice overexpressing either the uh, blue form, which is the early and uh, soon to disappear form, and the green form, which is a longer lasting form, showed that in fact hypertrophy, various muscle hypertrophy, could only be in, in, enacted by this one, and that this one had a rather sort of modest response on regeneration by comparison, inducing proliferation rather than um, any kind of real regeneration. Most importantly, Miranda Grounds, a collaborator in Australia, showed that a very similar transgene, except lacking any of those, back, uh, those, those C terminal peptides, actually couldn't, couldn't help with regeneration, at least in the skeletal muscle context, and in fact produced a large increase of circulating IGF-1, because in fact, this is exactly what the liver produces. Okay, so the uh, reason for this, we believe, I'm gonna tell you the whole uh, punchline to a lot of hard work by a number of people in my lab. Um, the, the punchline is that these e-peptides are very, very highly charged. And they are charged, their isoelectric point is very high, which means that they're likely to stick to the extracellular matrix. So Marion Heat in the lab decellularized a number of different tissues to see whether these, these peptides would stick to the matrix, and in fact, she found that they did. And I'm not gonna show you the data, but just a cartoon to show you what we think is going on. When these peptides uh, are produced by a cell, they stick to the extracellular matrix within the milieu, around that cell and other cells around it, whereas the form that is fully processed runs off into the circulation. This allows for an effective increase in the signaling downstream of the IGF-1 receptor and produces a prolonged response to this factor, which is why we think these um, e peptides have such an important role. Now, why they are, how they differ is another whole story I don't have time to go into. But one thing we do know is that at least one of them, EA, has a profound effect on the downstream signaling. Now, this is a long and complicated story, and signaling usually puts people to sleep. So I'm going to go very quickly through this. IGF-1 signals through the IGF-1 receptor. It's a canonical receptor tyrosine kinase. It then relays phosphorylation events down this stream through AKT, mTOR, P70S6 kinase. Probably each one of these is a subject of one of your research. Um, however, in this uh, particular context, the, um, this pathway appears not to be used by the propeptide. Specifically, we used AKT as a kind of canary in the coal mine, and we never saw activation of AKT downstream of either this EB early form or this EA late form. So this is our cartoon to sort of put all the signaling um, information in context, and I'm missing quite a bit here, actually. So uh, let's just say that the EB form has been associated with the um, AKT pathway through a, a very interesting um, isoform of calcineurin, which Enrico Larapetzi here at Imperial uh, char characterized when he was in the laboratory, and a proliferative response to this, this um, um, uh, isoform definitely is probably using this AKT pathway as well as other pathways involving inflammatory response. However, this form here never actually activates AKT and appears instead to activate a number of downstream AGC kinases such as PDK1 and SGK1. And um, 
there's been, and, and several of my uh, lab members have been interested in this, uh, namely Elem in the lab has looked at the SGK1 knockout and has noticed that uh, the downstream um, factor is probably NDRG1. So we're sort of teasing this apart. Others in the lab, Manlio Vinciguerra, who's here today, who was in at EMBL, looked at the way in which this signaling affected the, CERT, the sirtuins, and SIRT1 is a downstream effector of IGF-1, which has an, a number of very interesting um, uh, uh, ramifications, as well as AMPK downstream of FOXO phosphorylation, which blocks atrophy. So you can see that this is a multi-pronged sort of story, which I don't have too much time to go into, but only to show you some of Elam's data. And here you see uh, the knockout animal that Elam studies, and what she, she's done is to look at um, the effects of LAD ligation on a normal animal and an SGK animal and knockout animal. And here you can see uh, the beginnings of a, a thinning, which only gets worse with SGK. And in fact, the scar tissue is much more increased. So this suggests that, in fact, that is an important component of IGF-1 signaling. Likewise, she showed that these cells in culture do not form particularly good endothelial tubes and they are uh, defective in their migration capacity. So we think that we're at least in the right zone in terms of the signaling capacity of this, um, of this uh, molecule. But to whom are they signaling? What is, what's the target of this factor? Who, who's listening? And for this, um, we started to think about the immune system for a number of reasons. For one thing, the immune cells are early on the scene. They come in right at the very beginning. This is a picture of an infarcted heart taken by Alex Pinto in the lab, um, actually in Australia, who has been looking at uh, the macrophage component of regeneration in the heart. And what he's found is that heart attacks are, in, are literally uh, a, a st cause a storm of macrophage infiltration, which isn't surprising because this is a major injury. And macrophages are the, the sort of the garbage men, the cleanup guys. So just to remind you a little bit of how the immune system deals with injury, there is a sequential appearance of a number of very important immune cell subtypes, namely uh, the neutrophils, which are some of the earliest cells to come online, the macrophages, which are there to uh, help with the uh, inflammatory response, and ultimately the T cells uh, come in at the end for resolution of the injury and remodeling. So I'm going to switch now to a very interesting organism to tell you about the immune system and why we think maybe there's something to this idea that immunity might have something to do with regeneration. We ask the simple question, does a highly regenerative organism, such as a fish or a salamander, have a different immune system? And that's why it can get away with these feats. And to look at this, we uh, specifically focused on this wonderful creature, the axolotl. This is a Mexican axolotl. It's a Mexican aquatic salamander. It looks absolutely adorable. It has these fins, uh, rather these gills that are externalized. And um, it swims around and um, uh, eats its neighbor. Um, they tend to eat their uh, neighbor's arms off all the time. Um, this may be the reason why these guys are such good regenerators, because otherwise they wouldn't have any arms by the end of the month. Um, so don't be um, fooled by that sweet little face. Um, so we looked in detail at the way in which uh, the immune system responded to the loss of a limb in a salamander like the axolotl. So we looked at the resected limb, at the stump of the limb, and saw what was in there. Now, as you know, the uh, way in which mammals deal with injury is about a five-day sequential appearance of all these different cell types. Interestingly, in the axolotl, it was a SWAT team. All of these cells came in all together. So pro-inflammatory cells, anti-inflammatory cells, everybody showed up at the same time. So that was quite unusual. And it meant that there were literally as high levels of anti-inflammatory cytokines in that stump as inflammatory cytokines at the first instance, which was not at all what we were expecting. So we had a look at one of the easiest cells to get rid of um, without all the kinds of genetic manipula manipulation we have at our beck and call in the mouse. Um, and we decided to try to see whether any one of these cells actually had any effect on the regenerative response. So to get rid of it, we used a known way of loading liposomes with clodronate, which is a poison for macrophages and kills them. Now, with clodronate, therefore, you end up with no macrophages in the bloodstream. Um, all the other cells are fine. And so the protocol here was to load these animals with clodronate um, uh, liposomes 72 hours 
48 hours and 28 hours, three different sequential injections, or a single injection 24 hours before we resected the limb. Now, if you, do, if you do all three of these, you end up with no macrophages whatsoever at the time when you resect the limb. They come back in five days. It's a very rapidly replenishing cell type. So the animal only has five days without macrophages. Um, if you do a partial depletion, the animal has much lower levels of macrophages, but they come back a lot faster. So what happens? <clears throat> we were quite surprised at this. Here's the control axolotl. Here's, I don't know if you can see, it's a little hard to see, but right here at 40 days is this new limb. It's really like something out of an extraterrestrial um, sort of outgrowth. There's this, there's this um, healed over stump, and then this tiny little limb sort of grows out. It's, it's, it's quite eerie. Here's the uh, limb 60 days on, and you can see the little elbow starting because we cut it up here. And pretty soon it'll have a perfectly new limb. If you partially deplete with that single injection of the quadrinate liposome, you end up with a very pathetic little sort of spike. And if you completely deplete the axolotl's um, uh, macrophages at the time of injury, it never heals. Uh, it heals, but it never regenerates. So you get a stump, an amputated stump. And we waited 60 days, and it still didn't do anything. So the axolotl was wandering around with the stump. And when we looked to see what was going on, we noticed that whereas in a normal axolotl regenerate, there is a great deal of granulation tissue, which then resolves, and pretty soon you have the outgrowth of the limb. In the clodronate-treated axolotl, there was a massive fibrotic blockade at the top of that limb, uh, and that is probably why you didn't see any regeneration, because when we actually went in and resected that amputated limb, then the axolotl was fine. By then it had its macrophages back, and boof, off it went, and we got full limb regeneration. I don't have the pictures here to show you, but it looks the same. So what that says is that macrophages may be necessary, but probably not sufficient, to enable um, a scar-free healing event that is then amenable to regeneration of the entire limb. So clodronate liposomes are a very brutal way of knocking out every phagocytic cell in your immune system. So it's not very clean. And furthermore, we know that there's a real spectrum of macrophages in tissue repair. The early macrophages that come in are pro-inflammatory, and then they slowly start shifting over, if everything's going well, to an anti-inflammatory phenotype, and they start expressing various uh, uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-10, etc. And this has been appreciated only recently. It hasn't been something that people really realize that, they, that these macrophages have a dual life. And in fact, they're, they're known as M1 and M2, or classically activated macrophages and alternately activated macrophages. And there's a whole spectrum of other kinds of macrophages that I don't have time to go into. But simplified, it just means that some of them are pro-inflammatory, and they shift into an anti-inflammatory um, phenotype expressing such genes as IL-10, arginase-1, and MRC-1. And there are tons of these things in the mouse heart. Alex took a beautiful picture of a mouse that has a GFP transgene being driven by a fractal kind receptor, which is specific for those M2 macrophages. And just take a look at this. What he's done here is he's optically uh, uh, eliminated the cell bodies of all cells except for the GFP expressing cells. So what you're seeing is dapistane nuclei of all the cells plus the bodies of the macrophages. So this is just a slice through the heart, and you can see that these are abundant. So um, if, they are, if they're good for the heart, why aren't they doing a better job? And that's an interesting question. So we wanted to know what they are actually uh, doing in general. So we were lucky enough to have Klaus Nerloff next door to us. And um, this was back in the mid, whatever it is, noughties. Um, and Klaus was interested in the hematopoietic system. And he and his student, Daniela Ruffel, decided to uh, play around with a particular uh, gene, namely the CEBP beta transcription factor, which is known to have a very important role in hematopoiesis. And to make a long story short, Daniela did a heroic job manipulating just one or two base pairs in the promoter of this gene, which made it insensitive to CREB, which is another transcription factor, which meant that the gene didn't come on when it was stimulated by a, a, a pro-inflammatory response, which it normally does. And Daniela was very excited because she thought this was going to tell her profound things about the hematopoietic system. And to her total dismay, the animals were totally normal. 
they had normal levels of progenitors, normal levels of granulocytes, macrophage progenitors, their immune system looked perfectly normal. She was pretty suicidal at that point. So we did an experiment to try to cheer her up, and we injured the animal's muscle. And you do this by injecting a small amount of cardiotoxin into the muscle, which produces a very local, like a bruise in the animal's uh, um, muscle. And it's resolved after 10 days. This is the animal without that CEBP beta spike option. Now, these animals cannot regenerate at all. They just go completely fibrotic. And as you can see, this white stuff is the fibrotic tissue. And here it is as a histology. Here's the wild type up here after 10 days. And here's the mutant animal that cannot regenerate um, and cannot make M2 macrophages. So that was pretty exciting. And in fact, we think that this is because of a number of cell of uh, genes that are now compromised. And specifically, we were interested in arginase 1. And I'll just show you why we think arginase 1 is so important. It's actually important for turning L-arginine into polyamines, which is the beginning of a prosynthetic uh, protein synthesis uh, pathway, absolutely critical for um, um, regeneration. And if you um, get rid of the arginase, you end up favoring the alternative pathway, which is the INOS pathway, which produces nitric oxide and inflammatory response. And sure enough, when we looked at the macrophages uh, that we tried to activate out of these animals, we found that what really happened was just lots more nitric oxide, but not much else. So we sent it in for review, and the reviewers said, are you crazy? You've got to do a bone marrow transplant. Otherwise, you don't know whether it's the macrophages or the uh, endogenous tissue. So we did a bone marrow transplant, and these animals were transplanted with wild type or mutant bone marrow so that they then were chimeric, so that their bone marrow was either wild type or mutant, and the rest of the body was wild type. And then we waited for three or four weeks for bone marrow to reconstitute. Then we did the injury to see what happened. And what we found was a massive fibrosis. So just to recoup, the only cells that are mutant in this animal are bone marrow. The rest of the animal is totally wild type, and yet we get absolutely no regeneration at all. In fact, it's, it's severe fibrosis. We had to do the converse experiment, which you take wild type bone marrow and put it into a, an irradiated uh, mutant mouse. So now the whole mouse is mutant, and the only thing that's wild type is the bone marrow. You do the same protocol. You look to see what happens, perfect regeneration. So that means that it's all in the blood. So this is when I started thinking about the immune system pretty heavily, because I realized that we were up against a phenomenon which was much more profound than I had thought. So notice that the M1 and M2 appearance fits very nicely with the appearance of the IGF-1EB and then the IGF-1EA. Is there anything to this? Joe Tonkin in the lab got interested in this. And because we had these transgenic animals expressing the EA and the EB form, this time in the skeletal muscle, we decided to look to see what kind of macrophages were in these animals after we injured the muscle with that cardiotoxin bruise. And the way she did this was with flow cytometry, looking at the M2 versus the M1 fractions using various markers, and she quantified this. And what she found was that animals overexpressing this EA form were actually capable of amassing many more M2 macrophages, attracting many more M2 macrophages, or perhaps um, inducing them there compared to the EB form. Um, and this was true either for an acute injury like the bruise I told you about or in a mouse, mouse model of muscular dystrophy where you have continuous degeneration, regeneration. So something about this IGF-1 protein that we're so interested in, this EA form, seems to promote the, um, the trans mutation into this M2 pro-regenerative form. And you can see here just a few genes she picked out, arginase 1, that famous gene I just told you about, is much higher in the transgenic muscle that has the EA form. IL-10 is also high there, whereas INOS is typical of the EB form, which appears to be pro-inflammatory. And on top of that, it turns out that M2 macrophages turn on gobs of IGF-1. So what's going on? So here's the model we're working on right now with regards to the macrophage involvement in regeneration. The first thing that happens when you have an injury is inflammation. Inflammation is mediated in part by these M1 activated macrophages. These transit normally into this pro M2 form and do a reasonable job at repairing at least some but not all tissues. When we load the tissues with more of this substance, we must then promote this M2 response in a way that makes for a much more robust regenerative outcome. 
And as a result, we believe that the local form may be just um, a way of promoting what's already happening in a normal, uh, healthy regenerative response. But we were wondering whether there was anything about the circulating form that might have an effect. Because if you think about it, the immune system is circulating around. And so is the IGF-1 that's produced by the liver. So supposing we gave more IGF-1 in the circulation, would we see a shift in the immune response to injury? And so we started to do these experiments. But I just have to say I was completely shanghaied by one of my students. Luisa Luciani, who is obsessed with the idea that regeneration and autoimmunity were linked. And she insisted that before she did all the regenerative work, she looked to see whether IGF-1 would have any effect on autoimmune disease. So I'm terribly um, badly disciplined when it comes to my people in my lab. I let them do whatever they want. So Luisa and um, a wonderful uh, colleague who's running the fax facility at EMBL um, teamed up to do this following set of experiments. And that's, this is just the last part of my talk. We focused on T cells, because obviously uh, we hadn't had much to do with, we hadn't looked at T cells. And T cells are getting um, re-educated all the time in the circulation through the spleen, et cetera. As you know, T cells come in, an, in a number of flavors. I'm not going to go into this, because it's terribly complicated, and I don't understand most of the slides. So I'll just show you the parts I do. And um, the um, important part here is that there's a very Im interesting uh, subset of T cells called regulatory T cells. And for those of you who are immunologists, you know all about these. They're very chic at the moment. People are working on them all over the place. The reason is that they appear to have a, an immunosuppressive effect. And that might be very useful in a number of clinical settings. These are uh, uh, they're educated in um, a number of different uh, places. The thymus is the most obvious place, and they come in either natural or induced forms. Their role, whoops, sorry, their role is to uh, downregulate the accumulation of T effectors. And I won't go into how that happens, but just to mention the fact that there's a canonical transcription factor called FOXP3, which is the hallmark of a T regulatory cell. Now, just to put this in context, remember this is a whole story about development, among other things. When you're an embryo and when you're a fetus, you have to tolerate your mother. And that's not an immune, that's not a given, because your immune system and your mother's immune system are different. And in theory, you could mount a horrible immune response to your mother. So there are a lot of T regs in a, in a fetus. And that, of course, changes very dramatically when you're born, because then you don't have to tolerate your mother anymore. Well, you do, but that's a long story. <laughs> so at any rate, we decided to ask the question whether T regs might play, or sorry, whether IGF-1 might play a role in manipulating the immune system at the adaptive level, at the T cell level. And we did this experiment the following way. We made a mouse a type 1 diabetic with a low dose of streptozytosin, which is a classic way of making mice diabetic. At the same time, we gave them a tiny little mini pump under their skin behind their neck that pumped out IGF-1. Not the fancy form with all the stuff at the back, not the propeptide gubbins. I'm talking about the stuff you can put, get, a, get out of a bottle from Sigma. So we loaded up Sigma IGF-1 into these mini pumps. And we then treated the animals for 30 days, waiting for the normal response to the streptozytosin. So what happens is the pancreas begins to become diabetic. The beta cells fail. And in a glucose test, you see glucose mounting at a very high level because the body isn't able to uh, metabolize it. And here you see, um, the, this is just the control, and here you see the animals treated with IGF-1. So it's very impressive. There's a lot more glucose tolerance. And what's most impressive to me is the fact that we take the pumps out after 30 days, and yet these animals stay normal for the entire time that we analyze them, out, right out to 100 days and more. So it's something's been sort of permanently reshuffled in the immune system. And when we looked to see what was going on, we found that indeed there were more T regulatory cells in the pancreas of the animals treated with IGF-1. Here's the histogram to go with it. And we saw this by uh, following the FOXP3 transcription factor, which is a, a canonical uh, um, marker for T regs. And here's just a little more data to show you from Louisa and uh, Daniel that, in fact, this is an immune response. Cyclosporin completely abrogates it. And um, in fact, we found that this is true for both the um, uh, numbers of T cells in the pancreas, but also the way in which the animals responded to glucose tests. <clears throat> 
We then looked at proliferation and found that actually IGF-1 is very potent in proliferating Tregs. And we also found that um, IGF-1 um, appears to be having a very specific effect on the Tregs rather than TH0s, TH1s, and TH17s. For those of you who know what they are, you'll understand why that's important. And we also looked at a number of signaling intermediates downstream of IGF-1. And if we blocked those with a number of blockers, we found that we variously downregulated this response to IGF-1, as did um, an IGF-1 receptor inhibition, which obviously has implications for the way in which Tregs are responding to the IGF-1 in vitro. So we tried, we got excited. So then we tried another model. We tried the um, model of multiple sclerosis in mice, this EAE model, which isn't perfect, but it's an interesting model that a lot of people use. And what happens here is that the animals start to lose, just like an MS patient, they start to lose movement in their lower legs. And here's what happens after 10 days. This is the clinical grading, which just tells you how, how limp the animals are. And as you see, they get limper and limper and limper. And then all of a sudden, if they're treated with IGF-1, it kicks in and they start to recover. And it works even better if you let the disease progress a bit and then insert the pump because you've essentially primed the system. And there you see that, in fact, the animals start getting better much sooner. And in fact, they do very, very well. So this is a Kaplan-Meier plot of survival. And you see here, these are the animals that are treated uh, uh, with e the EAE-inducing substance, and they are not doing well. Here are the animals with the dotted line that are treated right at the beginning with IGF-1, and amazingly, here are the animals that are treated after the disease onset. So this is looking very promising. And so what we think is going on here is that the local form may be involved in improving regeneration, but the circulating form may have an important role in modulating the tolerance of the immune system to any number of stimuli, including that of autoimmunity, which of course has a great deal of interest from a clinical point of view. So how do we put all of this together and try to make some sense out of how the immune system regulates the regenerative response in um, both our um, axolotls and then in the mice that we've engineered to hopefully look more like axolotls? We believe that the innate immune system is important for local um, regulation of the, um, of the response to injury to produce better tissue regeneration if these M2s are increased and encouraged. We think that the adaptive immune system is probably responding to IGF-1 by activating these Treg cells, which are very important for producing tolerance, but also might actually be involved in increasing the capacity for the animals to regenerate. And of course, that's very speculative. Remember that M2s make tons of IGF-1, so this could all be linked so that more M2s are going to give you more IGF-1, which is going to give you higher levels of Tregs, at least locally, we believe. And we can, of course, mimic that by adding IGF-1 to the serum by the pumps. Now, what does this have to do with any kind of clinical relevance? Well, um, obviously, we're now looking to see whether IGF-1 pumps and those Tregs are important for regenerative response as well. You can just pretty much imagine all the experiments we're doing at the moment. But I'd just like to point out one thing, which is T regulatory cells are in the clinic right now, and they're being used for all sorts of things, graft versus host, type 1 diabetes, a number, you know, rejection of transplants. And the source of these is not that important, but the important part is that it's very, very hard to get enough of them. And in fact, as you see here, this is just a recent review in science, claiming how important these cells are, but claiming that it's going to be very difficult to make this clinically relevant at $40,000 per patient. You can tell this was from science rather than nature. And um, that, in fact, there's a real problem with expanding these cells ex vivo. And we're very excited about the possibility that IGF-1 will afford us that option. And um, we're in the, in the process of setting up a number of um, very exciting uh, collaborations at Imperial to ask that question. OK, so I'm out of time. And I'm going to finish by simply saying that We've looked at IGF-1 as a potential salutary factor for improving regeneration and learned a lot about regeneration in the process. We believe that suppressing inflammatory pathways are going to be very, it's very important. But immunosuppression isn't the answer, because then you get rid of all the other goodies. You get rid of the M2s. You get rid of the Tregs. So this has to be done very delicately. And one of the ways to do it is to improve the polarization of those macrophages over to the M2 phenotype so that they make more IL-10, so that they make more IGF-1, so that they help with the cleanup.
And then hopefully, we're going to make a connection between the immune response that we see um, when we uh, look at autoimmune diseases and the amelioration of that response with IGF-1 and link it together with regeneration. But that's where it's kind of fuzzy, and you can ask me all sorts of uncomfortable questions about this because I'm not sure I know how it's going to work. Anyway, I'm very optimistic because if we're losers, now we know a little bit more about how we can cheat. And that's, of course, the whole ballgame. So very briefly, I just want to um, go over the, the most important slide of all. These are all the people who contributed to the work I showed you today. And you can see the ones in yellow are the ones that are here or were here at Imperial. And I'd just like to mention um, Enrica Lara Pezzi, Bawana Pudel, Kaliani Panse, Rene Germack, and Lars Bachman, who are, um, have moved on. Um, Maria Palasantini is the master conductor of the orchestra. Without her, nothing would happen in my lab. Um, and uh, under her tutelage, uh, Jonas Lexo, Elam Zaran Pashne, and Tommaso Poggioli have um, all um, produced wonderful work. I'd like to also mention some of my uh, collaborating uh, uh, groups here at Imperial as well as elsewhere, and to um, thank the technical support of many people here and at EMBL for their incredible support and help. And then, of course, there's never going to be science without money, and here's where the money came from. Um, EMBL has been wonderful for the last decade, supporting my work. British Heart Foundation, um, through Michael Schneider's uh, wonderful grant, uh, has uh, helped us a lot. Um, a Fondation Le Duc, uh, which we also held with Michael, has also been very important. The Magdi Yacoub Institute out at Harefield has helped us an innumerable amount. Um, these are two funding agencies in Australia that support me, and the EU has been more than generous in helping me answer the question about how regeneration works. Thanks. <laughs>